encourage you today because God wants to encourage you today. The Lord is our strength. He's our shield. You know, he's uh, goodness and mercy are following us all the days of our lives. And we are eternally dwelling in his house. You know, our offering time is a time to honor him. And it's a time to give him the praise that he is so deserving of. I was just thinking as I have been taking the offerings um, with the theme of the prophet's reward. And that's something that I wanna continue to just uh, sort of pound into our spirits because I wanna personally testify uh, today about God's goodness regarding the prophet's reward in my own life. Many denominations, many ministries don't believe in the uh, full fivefold ministry. They don't believe in the ministry of the prophet. But you and I both know that Kim Clement was a true prophet of God. And my wife and I have been so blessed by God allowing Kim to come into our life, into our family, touching my wife and I, our children in such a beautiful, profound and powerful way. And I just wanna give God thanks and I wanna give God praise today because of that and for that. And uh, Jacob built a memorial when God uh, ministered to him in a very special way. And I have been, um, I've done the same. I have built a memorial to the Lord in my heart and in my in my re remembrance uh, for all that he has done, especially uh, bringing Kim into our lives. And it's just been uh, such a blessing. And I just want to say that there's something special because Jesus went out of his way to say, if you give a cup of water, you know, to someone, you're going to receive a reward. And he he said, if you bless a prophet, you receive a prophet's reward. There's something special about the mouthpiece of God, the spokesman of God, the messenger of God. And we honor God and we honor God's people. We honor God's messenger. So you have a unique opportunity being connected with the prophet and the house of destiny to come under a special kind of reward, a special kind of blessing. I believe it's special, I believe it's unique, and I believe it's to those who will step out of the boat and uh, sow as the Spirit of God leads you. Now God bless you in all that you do, and God prosper you in the work of your hand. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome House of Destiny, it's great to be with you today. I'm Greg Wark and I get to be your host and we're going to begin a series today on a book I wrote some time ago called A Good Death. And so we'll get into that in just a minute. But on a personal note, I really felt uh, because we are family and because you guys have walked through many of the different challenges and battles that Kim and I and the team, as well as our, our personal families have gone through, uh, I really wanted to share something with you. Most of you know that my wife, Amber, was diagnosed with cancer six months ago. Uh, and, you know, there's nothing uh, that, can, that prepares you for a diagnosis like that, especially when you've been married like Amber and I have for, you know, 44 years. It's just you kind of go through all the children. You go through everything the children go through. You go through losing a son. You go through all this stuff. You just... Nothing prepares you for it. Well, the interesting thing is that when, when we heard the diagnosis and then started to go through all of the medical procedures that you have to go through to deal with the cancer pre, um, uh, before the doctors actually remove it, um, you know, you, you, you really begin to dig in to prayer and to God. And I got to tell you something, I've never seen a woman... Um, do what my wife Amber did. She she is pressed into God and just we were just believing for a miracle. A lot of you were writing us. A lot of you were talking to us consistently, encouraging us. I want to thank you for that. But two Sundays ago, uh, just before we were to visit the doctor to 
do a pre-operation uh, moment. Um, Amber and I felt the Spirit of God come on us in a church service and something dramatic happened. We both felt it. We were both really shaken by it in a good way. Well, then we went to see the doctor uh, who was a leading uh, oncologist in this area. And the doctor had to do a colonoscopy. They had to actually put a thing inside of Amber's, um, you know, colon. And um, the doctor came out and looked at uh, Amber and said, the, there's no cancer. In fact, there's not even scar tissue. And I think he was so shocked, I don't think he knew really what to do. So he said, well, listen, let me take a, I'm, I took a biopsy, come back on Monday and we'll see what the biopsy says. Because he said, I think we, we really need to look at this. And, and afterwards we went and we sat down and the doctor looked at us and he said, you have no cancer, it's gone. And so I want to give God the glory, the honor, and the praise for healing my wife supernaturally so that she doesn't have to go through the rest of her life uh, dealing with the, the results of this different thing. So praise God for that. We thank you. Uh, most of the time when I'm talking to you, I'm standing so that I can move my arms a lot and do all sorts of antics. But this time I um, uh, hurt myself again, and this time I... Um, I not only tore my Achilles tendon, but I tore it in half. So I had to surgically bring it back together. So I apologize ahead of time for sitting here and talking to you about this really important subject, which is we're going to call it a good death. Now, I realize that uh, since I published this book, I've had a lot of people say to me, you know, how did you choose the title of the book? And I, you know, I, I, it's kind of an oxymoron, they would say to me. Numerous people have said it. it says, you know, when you think of death, you don't put it together with good. And I realized that. I kind of did it on purpose because I wanted people to look at the, at the title of the book and ask themselves, you know, what, what the heck is this all about? Well, you know, m most people don't kind of come to the conclusion that the, a good death comes from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He was the first to live a good death and to die a good death. And so we're going to go into that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to be introducing this book, every different chapter. We're going to go through that chapter together. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read some of the chapter and then I'm going to go ahead and just go wherever the Spirit of the Lord leads us. So, Lord, today, as a people, we ask that you would speak to us through the revelation of your word. We know, Lord, that sometimes we don't see as clear as you as you want us to. And then, Lord, in a time where death and destruction and deceit is so pervasive we need revelation we did, we need revelation from your word and so we ask that your presence would be here uh, that you would use me as a mouthpiece but that you would open our ears and open our understanding so that we might recognize the revelation that is life-changing um, you know to say that the born-again life is a gift is just about a huge understatement. Um, you know, you and I have had the opportunity to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. We as a people have really seen how transformative being saved is. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's a gift to us, but it's more than a gift. It's, it's something that transforms every facet of our body. It changes our spiritual DNA. It transforms us 100% as people. It unlocks our human greatness. It, it, it puts us in the, in the line of superhuman DNA because we're not... We're not fully human anymore. We are human beings with God living inside of us. Have you ever thought about that? That we're not fully human anymore? I'm not saying we're gods. I'm simply saying if God lives in us, then we are no longer a void, empty, dark place. We are the housing place of light. We have access 
to the transrational. We, God has uncovered our eyes and he's uncovered our ears. He has zoed our existence. Zoe is the word that is a Greek word for life. He's not only given us life, zoe, that means the God kind of life, but that life more abundantly. So we as people are in a position where we need to focus on the transformative power of salvation so that we expect more of not only ourselves, but of experiences in life and our relationship with God. Zoe, which is the God kind of life, I'll say it a few times, turns ordinary into amazing. Now, I'm pretty aware of the fact that some of you that are watching, in fact, I talked to some of you that are struggling, like Amber and I have been. You know, we didn't feel amazing when she was going through chemotherapy and radiation. We didn't, you know, we, we, we didn't feel that way. And I'm, I'm, I want to say this to you. Separate your feelings in this moment. Separate them out from what is truth coming from the Word of God, coming from our living Christ. Because no matter what you're experiencing over here, the fact is and remains that you are what you were ordinary and now you are amazing. As long as you have breath in your lungs today, you are amazing. And listen to me. Daniel, uh, David taught us in the Psalms that we're to say to our soul what we want our soul to meditate on. Sometimes you just have to have that talk with your soul and say, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. And, this is me paraphrasing, and I'm not going to let the circumstances of life and the surroundings of life the politics of life and all the other dynamics of life have an effect on the fact that I'm amazing. We need to look ourselves in the mirror when we wake up in the morning and say, I am amazing, not because we are, but because of the one who lives in us. The Holy Spirit lives within us, making us the potential for amazing every single day. One of the things that we can look to is scripture and we can see that fishermen were turned into world changers. Now, I've never been a fisherman. As a matter of fact, raising four sons, the only thing I ever did with a, with a fishing pole was to uh, uh, fix theirs. So I was there fishing with little boys, fixing their fishing poles. Uh, I have the patience I do not have patience. And if you're going to fish, you have to have patience. So I've never been a fisherman, but the way I view fishermen is that they stink, uh, they have smelly fish on a line, uh, they, they love it like a cult. But these guys that Jesus went and reached were fishermen. It was one of the main things that men did to provide for their families during that time. And so Jesus went to the fishermen and he led them to salvation. He filled them with his power. And the byproduct of that is men went from ordinary to extraordinary, beyond extraordinary, because of the power of God in them. Men with and women with no faith were turned into generals of faith. My favorite passage in Scripture, of course, is in Hebrews, where the, the Hebrews 11, which talks about the generals of faith. And if you study individually, this is fun, by the way, if you ever want to do this. If you study the lives of every person that is named there, and by the way, the ones that are named there, are trumped by the millions of other individuals that should be in that uh, and who have lived since and died a good death. It's interesting that people who had no faith, unbelief, they dealt with unbelief, they dealt with depression, they dealt with fear, they dealt with sarcasm, they dealt with sin, that, he tr that his power in them turned them into world changers. He turned murderers into apostles, subject it, 
matter is Paul the Apostle. He turned a murderer who was there holding a coat when Stephen was murdered, one of the great men written of in the book of Hebrews. Jesus, it blows my mind, he, he chose Paul of all people, the guy that was the worst of the worst to any Christian. Jesus saved him. This all says to me that we all have a chance at greatness. We all have the DNA of greatness in us. It gives all people, not just some, the same ability to live an extraordinary life. We are all, you and me, stewards of Zoe. We're stewards of Zoe. In 1977, and this is, by the way, I'm going to preface this by saying this, that, you know, I'm not really comfortable talking a lot about myself, uh, and the, but the problem is, in a book, when you write a book, you kind of have to integrate your own personal testimony into the writing of the book. And so I'm going to share a little bit right now about my testimony, and hopefully it'll encourage some of you that right now are really sensing or feeling that hopelessness or that you're worth nothing or that you're too old or that nobody cares about you or that no one would hire you anymore. All the other excuses we give for why we're not able to find something that gives us life in activity today. 1977, I was a lost uh, young man. Um, I was the opposite of a good choice for God. Um, and so, you know, you know, believe me, I study the people that were the opposite and I can only see opposites that Jesus, I was kind of like, why would Jesus, you know, I had this beautiful blonde that I met on the beach who led me to Jesus. And I was like, sure, God would, I knew why God saved her because she just absolutely had all the pa all of what was necessary to be saved. But me, I'm like, what do I have to offer God? And you know, we all know the truth that it, it's not, salvation is not about what we can offer God, it's what God can offer us through His grace and His mercy. And yet the fact that, that, that Jesus chose me as one of His sons to adopt into His family has blown my mind now for over 45 years. I was agoraphobic. Uh, most people don't know what that means, but essentially it means you're afraid of people. Now, isn't it comical that God takes a guy who's insecure, who really doesn't have any direction in life, no rudder in life, a guy who's afraid of people, and frankly, I had one dream, and that was to be a wildlife biologist because wildlife biologists doesn't have to interact with human beings. They just plot wildlife migrations through the Sierras. I even went to a college uh, early on that was uh, that focused on wildlife biology and that type of thing because I was basically choosing my future based upon my present fear. It may sound familiar to you. I was a loner. I liked being alone. Uh, I lived on the beach. I had one shirt. I had one pair of pants, and again, I had a dream that was pretty much unachievable. So here's a guy with no purpose, working just to eat, and these odd jobs, weird jobs, machinist jobs, and, and, and what I'm about to say, I just want you to kind of let it resonate with you. All that, and then God saw me. I don't know why I'm putting it that way, but I do want you to understand that you are not just someone that happened into the kingdom of God. You are not an afterthought to the Lord Jesus Christ. You are not kind of a mistake where you tripped into the kingdom of God. You are not in the kingdom because you were wounded so bad God felt sorry for you. You're in the kingdom because God saw you, regardless of what your condition was. And when God saw me, I remember it was nearing Easter Sunday of 77, when God gave me a set of two spiritual dreams. One was of the rapture, which was um, something that I had been told, you know, I've been raised my entire life as a Catholic, 
went to Catholic schools, attended mass, was an altar boy, but I never heard anything that remotely stuck with me that was biblical. I just knew a lot of tradition. And so when my mother-in-law to be started telling me about the rapture, you know, it was really, really interesting to me. So the night before I received Christ, I received two dreams, one of heaven, one of hell. And I'm not going to get into those. It's a pretty long story. But when I awoke uh, from early in the morning, um, I actually, I, it was so real to me that I actually felt like the rapture may have come and I just didn't know about it. So I got dressed real quick and raced over to my my girlfriend at the time, Amber's house, and I knocked on the door. It was really early. I knocked on the door, and the first thing I see is her father. And so I knew that that didn't mean the rapture didn't come. Um, no, just kidding, Harold, just messing with you. But I saw her father, and then, I, and then of course, I saw Amber. And that day, uh, when uh, we went to church that evening, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior and my Lord. And thus began the transformation of somebody who shouldn't and who shouldn't have been chosen but was chosen by the grace of God. True salvation doesn't just touch the afterlife. Now I, I know that this sounds like a like I'm just pontificating here right now, but I think it's important because today I notice that there are way there's way too much focus on the fact that I'm going to heaven. And, and that's really what the book, A Good Death, is, is about. It's like, come on, man. There's a life you have now that you've been made steward over that, that you can live. You, look, we live this life to its fullest. There's no example, not a single example in the scripture that gives us the permission to just kind of wait for the end and really pretty much just occupy uh, by the way, that word doesn't mean what it says. We're not just supposed to set up a tent and occupy until we die or Jesus comes back. We have a lot to do. We're made ambassadors of Jesus Christ. We're, we carry his message. We carry the strength of that message within us. And the Holy Spirit is in us to communicate to others things that, they, that Jesus thinks about them. Sunday I was in church and sitting next to Amber and we're worshiping and God gave me a word of knowledge for several people there, which, you know, it's kind of consistent with my gift. And I was able to give uh, several people that were really struggling a word of knowledge that helped them tremendously. And that's something that's not supposed to happen just in church. It's something that's supposed to happen all the time. So one, let me say this again, that salvation just isn't something that touches the afterlife. It isn't just the assurance of heaven. Please get that. And listen to me. I, I'm going to reiterate this over and over again. I don't care what your circumstances are right now. I really don't care. I'm 65 years old and I'm still seeing God use me because I expect to be used. Um, if, you don't expect for, if you don't expect God to operate through you, you probably will miss the multiple opportunities and one of the things I want to share with you is that every time God uses you to help another person, you're not just giving out. When you give, it is given back to you. Good measure, shaken down, shaken together, and foaming over. I mean, I, I, I don't know any other way to say that. Is that when you give, God gives it back to you. And not in the same measure you've put out. When God sees a vessel that's willing to be used, I don't care what your job is. I don't care what you are in, in life. I don't care if, you're, if, you, if you live in a tent or you live in a mansion. The same thing applies to all of us. We're here to not just exist. We're here to do something great for God. I'm, and I'm drawn to the Lord's Prayer. And, you know, that, when, the, when the disciples said to Jesus, you know, I want to know how to pray... Well, Jesus said, you know, uh, pray the Lord's Prayer. And I want to emphasize this little area in the Lord's Prayer. Jesus told them to say, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So 
we're not just supposed to only take time to concentrate on us being in heaven someday. We're supposed to be praying the Lord's Prayer that asks that God would bring heaven to earth. Now, listen to me. I want you to catch that. Heaven to earth. And that's both for us to experience as individuals and for others to experience with us and for Christians worldwide to watch happen. One of the things I've been talking about in the House of Destiny over a period of time is I've been talking about how wrong it is for Christians to be wrapped up in a political uh, maze. Um, I think we've made a huge error because the political world represents one of the beasts that is talked about in Revelation. And so we have gotten caught up in so many things that aren't really important. We've ceased to be the body of Christ and we've allowed ourselves to be owned by one side or another of a political institution that is guaranteed to fail over and over and over again. Now, I'm not saying that I don't stand for the principles of certain individuals and certain groups more than others. That's not it. But I stand first and foremost as a spokesman and a person who has Jesus as the focus of my attention. You know, I've thought a lot recently about the subject of racism. And, um, you know, I, 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 I must say that God has really touched my heart regarding those who have been treated over the last 50 to 100 years that racially profiled, racially um, Uh, you know, judged and treated so poorly by one race over another or by multiple races over another. And I thought to myself, you know, if that was the legacy of my life, if all of that torture that that one particular um, uh, group of people went through, I'd be pretty upset right now, too. People say, get over it. Well, let me let me say this. You get over it. I I need to get over it. We as people need to be messengers in a time of racism. We need to be those who have a message and we have something to say to those who are angry. And not just saying you shouldn't be angry anymore. No, we need to be saying, I don't know what you're going through, but I sure want to help you get through it. Now, I wrote A Good Death Because the thing that I fear most is not living his destiny. I don't fear the devil even remotely close to not living a life that Jesus put me on this earth to live. I can tell you right now, I know what life I would have lived if it would have been up to me. And I would have lived probably a lowly life afraid of everything if Jesus hadn't saved me. I fear not fulfilling his destiny. I don't want to leave this existence to see the face of God having wasted his grace. That haunts me. All that he did for me the death he endured on the cross, the grave for three days while he preached to the captives, the dead. His resurrection from the dead, he could have stayed in, he didn't. The resurrection from the dead so that he might save a guy who had nothing. He did that for me, he did that for you. This book, A Good Death, for me, It's more for me than it is for anyone. One of the things I learned working for the military or with the military for so long is certain quirks they have. Like a good example is is that sometimes when something's being said, they'll pull out a pen and they'll write something on their skin. And I'm like, what's why do you do that? They said, Well, paper's not always there, but I always carry a pen and it's near my skin. If it's on my hand, every time I lift up my hand, I look and I'm reminded. I wrote a good death so that I could be reminded of the death I want to find. It's kind of, and I'll close with this. I did another stupid thing. Well, it's not really stupid as of today, but years ago I had tattooed a lion on my foot. 
And then I had John redo it. It was bad enough the first time, by the way. It hurts like heck to have a tattoo on your foot. But then I had John redo it, and he did an amazing job on it. And there's a reason for it. Because every time I'm walking in my flip-flops, which in Tennessee we do quite a bit of, um, that I see a lion, and that lion represents something to me. That I'm not going to live my life like a lamb. I'm going to live it like a lion. My brothers and sisters... It's the great joy that I have to be called upon to, content, to deliver a message of encouragement to you. It's even more important for me to share with you a revelation that changed my life. As we go through this book, it's not my intention to sell books. Trust me, it's not. It's my intention to reveal revelation. My hope, my prayer, my desire is that through the revelation that God gave me in this book, that you, along with me, will walk into a path toward a direction toward uh, the destiny that God has called us as the house of destiny. God bless you. Thank you for joining us at House of Destiny. We are a network with many options for viewing. Our main House of Destiny broadcasts are every Saturday and Wednesday. On Monday's Prophetic Rewind, which is a look back at what Kim Clement prophesied over the years. And every Friday is Israel Update, which is all things Israel. Then we have Destiny Worship and Destiny Kids. Follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube and Rumble. Also, please subscribe to our email list at the bottom of our website. And for prayer, you can email us at hope at houseofdestiny.org.